Good afternoon and welcome to the System Design and Management webinar series. The System Design and Management program is a mid-career master's degree program that's jointly offered by MIT School of Engineering and the MIT Sloan School of Management. The System Design and Management program provides a systems thinking perspective that integrates management, technology, and social sciences to address rapidly accelerating complexity and change in today's global market. Graduates earn a Master of Science degree in Engineering and Management. The SDM program also offers a one-year certificate in Systems and Product Development. We're very pleased today to have Nisia Sabri present on How to Pick Breakthrough Technologies Using Network and Game Theory. Nisia Sabri is the Director of Strategic Business Development at Novanta, which serves the industrial robotics and medical technology market. She co-founded BitSense, which uses human and physical space data to improve cities, architecture, in real estate development. She holds an MS in Engineering and Management from MIT, an MS in Nuclear and Radiological Engineering from the University of Florida, and an MS in Physics from the Grenoble Institute of Technology in France. In 2015, she received the MIT SDM Student Award for Leadership, Innovation, and Systems Thinking. Nithya will present for approximately 45 minutes. Then we will open up the, quest the webinar for questions. Please use the chat feature on the webinar to ask questions and we'll respond to as many as possible. Please join me in welcoming Nisia Sabri for her talk today. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks, uh, Joan. Uh, very glad to be here for uh, this webinar where I will be talking about how to pick breakthrough technologies using network and game theory. Um, uh, Joan covered briefly uh, my bio, so uh, here it is uh, for um, additional information. I will skip over that and actually tell you a little bit about the research behind the presentation that we will see today. Uh, first of all, uh, it has to do with technology investment, and it draws from uh, the SDM master thesis that I submitted in 2016. I worked with Dr. Um, Oliver Dweck from the MIT School of Engineering and Dr. Alessandro Bonatti from uh, the Economics Department at the MIT Sloan School of Management. So today's agenda is really, uh, in a snapshot, three parts. Uh, the first part, we will talk about the context and challenges for um, technology investments uh, for firms in general. Uh, part two, which will be the bulk of the presentation, will be around how we looked um, and developed a data-driven approach to uh, systematically uh, scout and look for new technologies that would be a good fit to be added into uh, companies' portfolios. And the third part is about showing you real-world applications so that if you want to try it for yourself and for your company, you can have some starting points. So let's start uh, with part one. So we will look at the context and the challenges. Um, so first observation is that we see a fast rise of number of deals in, uh, involving a tech target. This is speaking in terms of mergers and acquisitions. And if you look at the recent report from the Boston Consulting Group um, that's cited um, uh, at the bottom of the slide, um, we see that today one out of every five transactions has a clear link to some form of technology. In addition to that, you see that the number of deals involving technology in M&A, uh, mergers and acquisition, has uh, been growing by 9% since 2012. The second observation is that tech deal market growth in value uh, is significantly outpassing the overall M&A market. So high-tech deals represented almost 30% of the total 2.5 trillion of completed M&A transactions in 2016. And finally, and perhaps most interesting to us and really for the topic of this presentation, is that the share of non-tech buyer is also rising. So you see that approximately 70% of all tech deals involve buyers from outside of the tech sector. So if you take these trends and this context, then you can imagine uh, that the question and the challenge would be how can firms gain a competitive advantage through technology acquisition? From a second report also from the Boston Consulting Group published this year, um, you see it uh, really spelled out clearly. I'm, I'm going to read uh, the paragraph on latent needs, 
as the pace of technology-driven change accelerates, a key question for senior execs has become, how do we position ourselves in a highly disruptive ecosystem? And more often than not, acquisitions of tech-driven and especially digital business models have become the instrument of choice to acquire needed technologies, capabilities, and products, and to close the innovation gap. So if you were to boil it down to one question that these execs at these firms have on their minds is really how do companies rapidly access the technologies that can advance their businesses and subsequently integrate them successfully with their current operations? So this is really the question that we that's highlighted and that we, are, we will take and break down into smaller questions we can address with the framework and the analysis that I will show you in the rest of the presentation. So we move on to part two, which is the bulk of the presentation. So a data-driven approach as an answer to the previous question we saw. Um, we further break this section into three. One is the framework. So I will show you the steps, the input data we have used, as well as the outcomes of the analysis. Then we will apply it to scenarios where we have a single firm interested in acquiring a technology target. And then we will look at competitive games where you have several companies competing for the same technology. So let's start by taking again that question we saw in the previous slide. So how do companies rapidly access the technologies that can advance their businesses? We broke down this main question into six smaller questions. The first one is, how do we build an appropriate technology landscape? And then once that's done, how do we link these technologies together? These two questions represent our framework. Or in other words, the framework I will be discussing will show you step by step how we did this. Then we said, okay, great, we have a framework. Now we have a technology landscape. We know how they are connected together. What does it mean for a single firm? So then we ask the question, how do we represent a firm's position on a te technology landscape? Or in other words, its portfolio of technology or know-how? And how do we define the technology options a firm has? Meaning beyond what it already knows how to do and what it already owns. What are the other good options the firm has? And then finally, we looked at competition because we know, and as we have seen in the previous slides, competition is really rising. So how do we evaluate the payoffs of different strategy in a competitive game? And how do we select the best path forward? So this really summarizes what we will see in the rest of the presentation, and then I will address each one of these um, separately. So let's start with the framework. The framework, we broke it down into these really six components, starting by the steps. So let's define what does the framework need to do. The framework needs to allow us to create a technology landscape, then define links between technologies, then map a firm's position, then find new technology options, and finally look at payoffs of different strategies. In other words, these steps really represent the questions we have seen before. This is a snapshot of the process flow we had developed. So you would see from the starting point, the data sources that we chose to work on. In this particular case, and I will tell you more about it, we went with an MIT technology review selection of breakthrough technologies. We applied natural language processing to define the linkage between the different technologies. We transformed that into network graphs so we can visually see the technologies, how they are connected together, but most importantly, have the firm position in that space. Then we used the network metrics that we created to turn them into benefits and costs for each one of those technologies. And once that was established, then we brought a game theory framework to look at payoff matrices in a competitive game and really look at both single as well as multiplayer games. 
what you see on the right hand side and the left hand side are things we have uh, decided at the time of this study to leave for um, further exploration or future work. So for instance, and you will understand this a little bit better when I get there, we didn't include the relevance of the natural language processing uh, results into the network. That's something we wanted to do later on. We also wanted to look at payoff matrices and movement in the technology landscape using a Markov perfect equilibrium model, which we didn't do, and we used a simpler approach initially. And then exogenous inputs were more so to look at other data sources, adding a firm existing portfolio, looking at uh, net present value from a point of view of benefits and costs, including multiple strategic decisions, as well as validating the framework with historic cases. What I can tell you is that some of these um, I have been applying in uh, my everyday work um, at Noventa, and I would be happy to share some insights, uh, specifically in looking at other data sources and then looking at different meanings of benefits and costs. But let's let's dive into these steps so you can understand what we did to build the framework. So as I said, for the input data, uh, we looked at different sources, as you can imagine, from patents to um, journals to other types of descriptions of technologies. And for a number of reasons, we decided that, um, uh, that actually the MIT Technology Review really offered, uh, gave us a good representation of the social technical environment of a technology which was relevant. Um, we looked at 150 articles uh, spanning uh, the period from 2001 to 2016. As every year, the MIT Technology Review uh, publishes the 10 breakthrough technologies for the year. And then the content, so we went to every article, and that's what we used as our input for the natural language processing piece. Here is an example. Um, we were looking for articles that had not only the technology, but also a description, companies that are involved, organizations, as well as key stakeholders, as we um, deemed that these were also relevant connections when you are looking at how can your company get closer to a certain technology. So for instance, immune engineering here in the article had listed some companies that were doing it, but it also listed companies that were doing similar or competitive uh, technology. So I'm going to use this immune engineering as an example in the next slide to help you see what do we extract from a text like this. So let's move to NLP, so uh, natural language processing. From a single article related to immune engineering, we extracted four types of data tables. The first one was around concepts. Uh, on average, each technology uh, had around eight uh, plus or minus concepts, uh, plus or minus one or two. But for the most part, it was around eight concepts, and that had um, a, a given relevance as, uh, assigned to it. What's interesting is that, for instance, uh, if you look at the article, uh, this concept here didn't actually appear in the article. It was inferred from linking together keywords and words in the article. And that's really where we believe there is a natural language processing algorithms today allow you to be able to find more connections between technologies because of this concept output. We looked at keywords, and there were, for the most part, around 30 keywords per uh, technology. It also gave us relevance of these keywords for the given technology. What's interesting and, and what was um, relevant for us was to look at entities. So you have different types of entities that uh, the natural language processing algorithm gave us, uh, from cities to companies to field terminology, as you can see here, organizations, people. Um, what was uh, very important for us was to be able to link it to companies. And then finally, we were looking at taxonomy, which is really in, in what industry, uh, broadly speaking, would this technology fall into? And same thing, we had a relevance 
score. So once we had the data, we had these tables from the natural language processing step, we were able to build our adjacency matrices. So first of all, uh, again, if I start with immune engineering, as you can see here, we built tables that had products, for example, on, um, on the rows and concepts, all concepts aggregated. Um, when we did it, we ended up with uh, 675 concepts. Um, as you can see here, as an example for immune engineering, these concepts we have seen were connected to this particular technology, but they were not connected to other technologies such as 3D transistors or the Tesla autopilot. So it's a one if it's um, related, and it's a zero if it's not. Then we took uh, these, uh, this cross tab really, um, and then uh, did really a, a product of the two matrices, the cross tab and the transpose of the cross tab. And, and this one was just transposed. The concepts were the rows and the columns were the products. And the same thing, as you can see for immune engineering, the concepts that we saw were related to this technology all score one, whereas for the other technologies that don't relate to these concepts, you would have a zero. And then, um, then we created the adjacency matrix. And here what it, um, if, if I were able to give you a bigger snapshot, of course, you would start seeing that some, te some technologies are connected to others. In this particular example, only the diagonal has a non-zero um, input uh, because for these particular three technologies, they are independent of each other, no connection from concepts. The reason you see an eight here is really linked to what I was saying, um, the number of concepts generated per technology. On average, it was around eight. So if there are eight concepts that link two technologies together, then you would see an eight. If there are three, you would see a three. If there is one, you would see one. If there are none, you would see a zero. Uh, obviously, immune engineering is connected to itself through all eight of those concepts generated, so it would score an eight. If you were to generate the same adjacency matrix uh, using keywords, for instance, uh, as we saw in the previous slide, uh, there were around 30 keywords, you would see 30 here. So this is, again, just a reminder of how did we get this number here through uh, a, a really a product of the two um, matrices. What was interesting was that by doing this adjacency matrix for concepts, for keywords, for taxonomy, for companies, to be able to link technologies together, we generated four networks. What you see in light green here is the number of nodes. So for instance, the network that we generated from nodes as technologies and links as concepts was 149. And then the number of links here was, um, I believe, around 500 or so. What we also did, because it's relevant for this analysis, was to link companies together. So how do we know that two companies have a link even though they are not necessarily operating as a subsidiary of each other, but they are rather linked based on the technology they are working on. So we took nodes as um, companies and the links represented either concepts or technology. And in this case, uh, we had many more companies, around 225, and then when the links were concepts, we had around north of 3,000 links. When they were technologies, we had much less, around 500 links. I will tell you, we will, these two, um, I suggest you keep them in mind, meaning a network of technology linked by concepts and a network of companies linked by technology, because we will come back to them and we, as we will really look at how do we project a firm portfolio and how do we work in competitive scenarios. So let me move on to the network now. Uh, just as a reminder, so this is the network uh, uh, really uh, view of a matrix, an adjacency matrix. So 
So as a reminder, if you have an adjacency matrix like this, uh, with no connections between these blocks, then you would end up with two disconnected um, uh, uh, networks. If you have uh, connections that happen off of the diagonal, then you have a connection between them. But other than that, uh, a network is just really a different view of this adjacency matrix. So just so we are all on uh, uh, the same page in terms of definitions, so nodes, for the most part in what I will be covering, nodes represent technologies. So for example, immune engineering would be one, a Tesla autopilot would be a different one. The links represent semantic similarities between two nodes. That's again the extractions we use from the natural language processing step. If I'm looking at a network where links represent concepts, it means that a link and the weight of that link represents how many concepts the two technologies share together. Interestingly, if you look at a network view, so the peripheral clusters represent niche applications that are less central to the overall network, whereas um, uh, central nodes are important to the rest of the network. They have more connections to the rest of the nodes. And then dense clusters contain highly similar technologies. So if the distance between two nodes is small, it means they are very close or very similar, and therefore, if the cluster itself is dense, it means most of these technologies within it are very close to each other. Contra in contrary, there are some clusters where technologies are more spread out, and so there is less similarity. Then moving on to look at nodes and network level measures. So these will be very important for us as we continue because again, the objective here was to be able to use a network and its measures and metrics to uh, assess, affirm um, options in terms of technology, benefits and costs, um, as well as uh, in competitive gains. So what's important? Each node has a degree, so that's the number uh, of neighbors it has or it's connected to. Uh, it has a measure of closeness. So closeness really is the, is, is the inverse of um, farness. It just means that uh, the node is close to uh, many other nodes in the network. And betweenness is uh, a representation of that node being part of a path between two other nodes in the network. So for instance, if a node has a high betweenness uh, a metric or value, uh, it means that if you take any two nodes from different um, edges or sides of the network, um, they pass by then that the path that connects them will cross uh, that node more often. So, uh, and, and then going on to the links, the links, what's important about them is the weight. And again, um, from the previous slide, the weight represents really how close they are connected to each other. The more concepts they share, um, the, the closer they are together, um, the more, um, and, and you will see later why we, will, we, we did that, the weight, we took an inverse of the weight, so the, the shorter the distance between the two. Um, so let me move to then um, the, the final piece of this framework, which is the visualization, it doesn't, in, in, um, and oh, before I move to that, um, actually two, two pieces of information that are important here. One is, if you recall, I said, we looked at technologies through concepts, and we looked at companies through technology. We looked at statistics to be able to understand whether these networks were um, uh, closer to random networks or if they were closer to um, uh, real-life uh, networks. So what we found was that on average, uh, a technology is connected to 13 other technologies, uh, while a company is connected to four other companies. 
we read that through the average degree uh, here for technology through concept and the average degree for companies through technology. Um, and um, what you see here on the right hand side is really um, a power law fit of the number of nodes as a function of degree. It just means there are um, here uh, uh, more nodes with a smaller degree and then it decreases. And typically, uh, what you would see is that for random networks, um, the power law fit is really good. Um, it's, as you can see, it's slightly much better here for companies than it is for technologies. Uh, but it tends, when you tend to look at real life networks, the power law fit is not as good. So uh, these were important, again, um, statistics for the network describing technology through concept and companies through technology. So um, the last step was the visualization. Uh, what we wanted to do here, and this is how you read this, you read lines first and then um, columns. So we started, as I mentioned, with um, 15 years really worth of um, technologies we started in 2001, stopped in 2016. So for each year, each dot represented technology that was covered. And the links were links along concepts. So as you can see at the very beginning, the technologies were fairly spread out. They didn't have very dense links. And then as you progress through the years, we see that the, the, the clusters, individual clusters, are becoming denser. And they are becoming denser before creating links with other clusters. Uh, for instance, um, this black cluster here of living matter, um, you can see it becoming much denser before starting to create connections with other clusters later on. So um, that was an interesting observation uh, that uh, we had an understanding that technologies, for instance, if you take uh, information technology and you take um, biology, both evolved separately before uh, bridging and being able to use uh, more um, IT uh, technology in solving um, biotech uh, issues. So, so this really forms uh, the, the framework again. Um, we had um, simple steps. We started with the data from MIT Technology Review. We extracted from each article through natural language processing, um, concepts, keywords, taxonomy, and companies. Then we looked at how uh, closely together technologies are connected, the adjacency matrix. We turned them into networks with nodes and links. Um, and finally, we visualized these networks of technologies. So at this point, we are really ready to use this framework in these networks to uh, study further study what a single firm can see, and then how a competitive games can be carried out. So let's move on to the single firm. So the message here is that from a firm's know-how or technology portfolio, we can define a path to a target technology. So how do we do that? So first of all, we take our network of each node representing a technology and each link um, is built based on the concept. The stronger links uh, represent more concepts shared, uh, whereas the um, uh, smaller links or thinner represent uh, less concepts shared. If you take a company that's connected to a number of technologies, then you can project these technologies on the network and see if, for instance, uh, a firm is highly specialized in one area of the network, or if, in the contrary, its technology portfolio is spread out and covers different uh, segments or clusters of technology. Once you do that, what we built next was a connection between a pair of technologies, a source and a target. So let me explain what that means. It means, for instance, that here we picked a technology that was labeled solar fuel. And we were curious to see whether from solar fuel, which happens to be in this side of the network, we were able 
to connect to a technology in virtual reality, Magic Leap, which happens to be on completely the other side of the network. And again, uh, because uh, this network is socio-technical, it means that these connections doesn't, don't only happen along a pure technology play, but if the same companies are connected or have them in their portfolio, or if key stakeholders or IP happens to be shared, then we would be able to find a link. And so um, what the algorithm did was to go through um, all the possible paths and uh, find the shortest path between these two technologies and calculate the cost. So these small numbers that you see here are really the cost of that link from moving to one node to the next. And it happens that this is a really very expensive link um, in terms of when you add up uh, all the weights along these paths, um, and it's a high cost actually technology target here. But the idea here that you can generalize is that for any one technology as a starting point, let's say a firm knows how to do or owns, stakes uh, in, you can move to a target of your choice and see what would be the best path to do so. Um, the third uh, piece here is that when there are multiple um, shortest paths, so the shortest path is not unique, in other words. Um, if you add up uh, the, the costs of these links, there are different options to get from, again, a source to a target, um, but there are different paths along the way. So we actually developed, we, we forced the algorithm to be able to if the shortest path is not unique, to return a recommended shortest path that includes the most visited nodes. Um, meaning that if two paths um, uh, share a number of nodes before diverging, then those number of no those nodes would be included in the final path, um, and then so on for the next uh, node. So in summary, first we verify that there is an actual path that exists between a source and a target technology. We look at the shortest path. Uh, we look at the number of links in the shortest path because every time you acquire or, or develop a certain technology, it has, um, it's taxing and it has a cost, so we would like to minimize that. When there are, we look at all our alternative shortest paths with the same length, and then if the shortest path is not unique, we return a recommended shortest path that includes the most visited nodes. So then what do we do? Um, each target technology uh, has a benefit and a cost associated to acquiring it. So in this case, I'm, I'm starting really to build a foundation for how we are going to use these paths and network metrics to be able to play games. So to play games, um, you need payoffs. It means for every given strategy you take, you need to know um, whether it's going to provide benefit or not. So we start by calculating the benefit, and to do that, we use the, the, we use, uh, the, the network metrics of degree, closeness, and betweenness um, I mentioned earlier. We looked at the costs, and the costs are really the sum of all the links that take you from a source node to a target node. And then the payoff was the benefit divided by the number of competitors. If there's only one company, a company M trying to get to this technology, then it's a one. If there are two, then that would be two, and the benefit would be less. Um, and then uh, minus the cost of that link. So as I was saying, when really there is no competition because we are in a single firm um, scenario, um, what we see is that um, the payoff is simply the benefit minus the cost. And this SM here, um, star, is the best strategy the company or the firm has in getting from a source to a target. What is a strategy? A strategy is really a decision to go along a certain path. Going through this path is one strategy. Going through this other path is another strategy. So what we are saying is first, we optimize it for the firm and find the best strategy. And then we use that 
to be able to plug it here and say this is the cost of this path while the benefit doesn't change the benefit is strictly connected to the node itself so we did that for every single node in the network and what we saw was that depending on the firm's core vertical market some technology targets are more attractive than others so let me explain what this um, this plot here shows um, the nodes that are in blue represent a pair of a source technology and a target technology and if it's in blue it means that it starts in a certain cluster and it and and that's the source and the target is in a different cluster if it's in any of these different colors for example living matter is in green it means each point here represents a pair of source and target technology but both of them belong to the same cluster which is living matter and if you look at this from terms of benefits versus costs you see that the highest benefit and the lower cost tends to be for technologies that stay within the core vertical market of the, the firm's technology. So if a firm is already active in living matter, which is for all intents and purposes biology, for instance, then the highest benefit technologies and the lowest cost would be also uh, in biology. In energy, which is red here, there is really a wide range. And the reason is that energy also includes very different forms of energy from renewables to more traditional. Um, so the, the learning from here was really that uh, it matters where your target is. So the further away from your core technology as a firm you are um, targeting, the potentially the higher the cost, or uh, the, the lower the benefit. So let's, let's take this approach of source and target and let's apply it to a competitive game. So what's different? In a competitive game, the payoffs change depending on the actions of the competitor. So the benefit again is the same, the cost is the same, the payoff here is the same, just like we defined it earlier. But where you need to pay attention is to the C. So the C here is the number of competitors uh, targeting the same technology. Uh, and so the more competitors, the lower the benefit of a firm. Uh, the rationale for choosing this is really to say that if multiple competitors are targeting to develop the same technology, then ultimately when it hits the market, they would be sharing the, pro the, the revenue. It's a market share. Whereas if only one company was developing that technology and marketing it, it would be having essentially most of the market share. So here, uh, just to help visualize what these equations mean, it means, again, if we start with our company M, which has a source node I M, and it has a best strategy S star M to go and acquire this technology J N, which belongs to company N, but then all of a sudden there is a competitor X that's also playing its best strategy, then these, this is what it means when you see here in the payoff S star M and S star X. If you're familiar with game theory, you start recognizing a payoff matrix, which essentially is trying to help us understand, let's say for company M, if company M invests in a, in a new technology and company X, the competitor, also invests, then this is how we are going to calculate the payoff. If company M does not invest, then it has a zero payoff, and company X invests, then it takes all of the market share. Uh, and then inversely for competitor X, this is if company M invests, so the competitor decides to stay out, and this is where neither of them invests. So let's take this and actually apply it to a few examples, actual companies and technologies they might be pursuing. So this is a case. Uh, these are two actually cases. Uh, in one, in the first one, we looked at Apple and Tesla. Um, and uh, we looked at um, whether they were uh, competing for um, a technology starting from their 
own portfolio and targeting um, a, a technology. I think in this case, uh, it was car-to-car um, -car communication. So we built the payoff matrix based on their position in the network and the position of their starting um, nodes or the source nodes, as well as the target um, node. So let me help you uh, read this. So uh, what we're saying here is that uh, if Apple invests and Tesla invests, this is the payoff. It's a negative 0.3 for Apple and it's a 0.65 for Tesla. If Apple doesn't invest, then Tesla takes all of the benefits. On the other hand, if uh, Tesla um, uh, does not invest, but Apple invests, then all the benefit goes to Apple. And if I say benefit, sorry, I mean the payoff, obviously. And then if none of them invest, then it's a zero, zero. So let's look at Apple. So if Apple invests uh, in, in this line, so um, and it, Apple is considering investing or not investing. So we are comparing minus 0.3 to zero, and we're comparing, and in this case, zero is better, so do not invest. And if we're comparing 1.36 to zero, 1.36 is better. So in this case, it's invest. So Apple doesn't have a clear strategy. It kind of depends on what Tesla is doing. But if you look at Tesla, Tesla invest is 0.65 compared to zero. So invest is better. And in this case, 2.31 compared to zero, this is also better. So the conclusion is that Tesla has actually a dominant strategy. In all cases, no matter what Apple does, Tesla should invest because the payoff is higher. Therefore, since Tesla will invest, then Apple is really playing in this column and do not invest becomes the, the obvious strategy for Apple. So this is the case where there is an actual dominant strategy. We looked at another case where Apple and Toyota, for instance, were competing for a technology, and it just wasn't clear. There was no dominant strategy. So for instance, um, if Apple was deciding whether to invest or not, in one case, zero is better than negative 0.3, so it's do not invest. In the other case, it's invest, so it's, it's not clear. Uh, for Toyota, the same thing. In one case, do not invest zero compared to minus 0, um, 0.85, so do not invest is better, whereas in, in the other case, invest is better. So none of them has a dominant strategy. So in that case, what we did was looking at the probability of one of them investing and what the other one's um, response should be. So in, just to maybe quickly summarize it, Apple's investment strategy depends on its belief of the probability of Toyota actually investing. Whereas Toyota investment strategy also dependent, depended on its belief of the probability that Apple was going to invest. In clear or in more practical case, how would you even use this? This is really by looking at what the competitor is doing and the different signals the competitor is putting on the market signaling whether they are at a high probability of investing or not. Where signaling um, becomes really um, and important. Okay, uh, and, and another case, and I'm trying to uh, maybe go slightly faster uh, uh, so we can have time for Q&A, but uh, an, another thing we looked at was how technology price can affect the payoffs and actions. Uh, we looked at a case actually that was in the news at the time, which was Boston Dynamics, and Google um, was preparing to sell Boston Dynamics. And we were not sure um, at the time, uh, we were looking at this uh, based on press articles, it wasn't clear who the contenders were. So we took um, actually um, a, a hypothetical game where Toyota and Amazon were both interested in buying this from Google. And, um, and so we mapped out the positions of um, Amazon and Toyota, and we mapped out the target uh, technology agile robots uh, here. And we calculated, based on the best strategy for Amazon, the, base, the best strategy for Toyota, what would be the payoff. Um, in this case, we decided to introduce the price, actually, of the technology. 
and uh, we looked at different levels of prices going from zero all the way one, two, three, four, and five. And in each case, we plotted um, the payoff that uh, the companies would have in actually going in and, and bidding really for the technology. If the price was zero, both of them had an incentive and a pay positive payoff to go and um, bid. Um, if, uh, as the, the price started increasing, we started seeing that um, uh, in one case, for instance, Amazon had a clear dominant strategy uh, to invest uh, or to bid, which made, made it clear that Toyota shouldn't go into the game. Uh, as we kept increasing the price, we, uh, we entered a zone where there was no dominant strategy, but it was clear that there was only room for one, so it was really about estimating the probability of the other one um, entering the race. Uh, it was the same thing for prices two and three. And then we, uh, we ended up uh, at the price of four where, um, again, Toyota was out, Amazon was barely in with a positive payoff. Um, and then the price increased enough that both of them actually had a negative payoff and incentive to stay out. So that was just another view of how can you add additional information beyond just the benefit of the node, beyond just the cost of the link, but also including more real life inputs such as the price of a technology. So, um, so with that, um, I wrap up the part two, which really describes the framework, um, the data, and its applications for um, a single firm as well as competitive games. And I wanted to show you actually a few real world applications um, to, to, so you get a sense for where um, this is actually applied. For instance, uh, if we start in consulting, uh, McKinsey actually has its own homegrown startup and investment landscape analytics um, with features that really to inform strategic and investment choices for organic and inorganic growth. Uh, we know that they have applied it to about 100 projects. Um, it helps provide a market map, identify disruptive trends, um, um, and also um, identify potential partners and competitors. And the benefit is really um, going from weeks to days in terms of generating a market map. It's finding more white spaces, meaning areas where uh, technologies can apply uh, that maybe a firm doesn't know uh, about yet or, or hasn't explored yet. And there are much less expert interviews now that you can automate and draw these maps from um, harnessing data. Um, BCG also, Boston Consulting Group, um, has uh, published many reports uh, using such approach, again, of network-generated um, views and landscapes um, as far as uh, the reports explain uh, the nodes in this case represent companies as opposed to technologies. But again, it's the same um, approach of linking companies together uh, through semantic uh, really proximity uh, and, and be able to cluster and put them into a segment. Um, for example, there was um, uh, a report uh, on robotics, a very interesting report that, that was looking at the evolution of the market. This is a snapshot of one of the interactive reports that you can find online as well. Um, and this is um, a more recent one uh, from QUID, which is the, the service and the, the back end that these reports and uh, at least the network maps are created with. Um, uh, and then um, moving on maybe to some examples from industry. So QUID, which I mentioned when I was talking, um, describing the, the BCG slide. Um, so QUID uh, claims that in side-by-side -side comparison, the QUID intelligence platform delivers insights four times faster, ten times broader, and five times deeper than traditional tools. And if you have access to the tool, you can really start um, searching in different areas, both for your current or core, vertical markets as well as exploring from technologies and, and keywords. Um, and uh, Quid actually on their website uh, lists uh, a few uh, of uh, the customers they have. And as you can see, uh, what I thought was interesting was that 
uh, it really spans different players from technology to consulting, healthcare, marketing, financial services, and you see some, uh, you know, fairly big names here. Um, so in summary, um, if, if we summarize a little bit what we talked about in this presentation, as we go back to the context and challenge, uh, what to remember is that the number of tech deals in M&A, mergers and acquisitions, is increasing, their value is increasing, and the share of non-tech players is rising. It means that these firms would benefit from understanding better technology areas they are not players in and uncovering more technology areas that are promising. And so really there is a clear need for across the board, maybe a more data-driven approaches these companies could use to rapidly access these technologies. In this approach, um, we went beyond patents and we showed that uh, data sources, other data sources that represent social technical environment of technology are proving useful. Um, in, in particular, if you want to include financials, uh, sources like capital IQ, crunch base, news and journals are, are really interesting um, data inputs. Natural, proce natural uh, language processing is finding connections that m may be hidden or not obvious at first uh, sight. Networks offer insights on core and niche technology applications. Uh, if you remember, uh, nodes at the center of the network versus the edge. And um, a firm, uh, if, if you start from a firm know-how or current technology, um, then uh, we are able to define a path to a target technology. Um, each, but you have to remember that each technology has a benefit and a cost. We had a simplified calculation of what benefit or cost is, but as you also saw, you could include price, NPV, other measures of benefit and cost. And what we also saw was that depending on a firm's core vertical market, some technology targets are more attractive than others. Um, in competitive game, finally, the payoff change depending on the actions of the competitor. Uh, I don't think that's a surprise to anyone, but um, I think it's interesting to try to uh, put a quantitative spin on it and see where to go in and where to stay out. And finally, um, uh, what uh, we saw is that data-driven approaches are increasingly used in consulting and industry. And my message to you is you can do it too. Uh, there are commercial services uh, out there, such as Quid, um, uh, the Scylla from McKinsey. Um, I'm sure there are others, uh, but you can also have a homegrown um, uh, system, just like what we did. We used open source, uh, really, tools, uh, Python-based for the most part, as well as an IBM Watson API. Um, but what you need is the right skills um, in-house. Um, that uh, closes uh, the presentation. So um, back to you, Eric, for the Q&A. Thank you so much, Lucia, for that uh, excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, we did have uh, two questions, one from Tak Sakobi, uh, who actually just followed up saying the slides, uh, answered uh, their question. Uh, we do have another question from uh, Eros Sigma saying, I'd like to read the full text. Uh, was this Nisia's SDM thesis? Uh, the question was, was this the uh, a thesis? Yes. So the approach and all of the details you can find in the SDM thesis. Excellent. Uh, so we have a few more minutes for uh, any more questions for anybody watching. Feel free to uh, drop your question in the chat over on the uh, right side there. Uh, this was also going to be the uh, last uh, webinar for 2017. Uh, we'll be picking back up in 2018, I believe in February. Uh, Thomas Sedlick says, great presentation. I would be interested in how the methodology, uh, methodology uh, would take into account the recent wave of patent licensing and patent portfolio open up, such as Tesla did a couple of years back. Oh, very, yes, we actually looked at patents, and we looked at patents from Tesla in particular. Um, we did an analysis where we actually linked companies and technologies in a multi-layer view. Um, and uh, it gives you different insights, of course. Uh, it's interesting. Um, what we found with patent, the, the weakness was that um, a, a lot of the patents were linked to a particular component or a subsystem inside a, a product. So it didn't really talk about the technology as a useful uh, uh, system, 
but uh, only one part of the system. And for, uh, for investment um, purposes, we really wanted a view that talked about um, a, a useful system in essence. Uh, but patent views are, are also very interesting. As a matter of fact, PatSnap, uh, which is a service I think available through MIT, uh, is starting to do more and more of that, that visualizations through networks and connections between patents um, and uh, and also, I, I believe, links to technologies. So I think we we see all types of data inputs being applied to this, and, and I'm sure they can generate um, very useful and, and different uh, insights. Excellent. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, Henry, I apologize if I put your last name uh, from Henry Halvian. Uh, you talk of M&A. How does it change if you work with a company rather than acquiring it? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, as a matter of fact, again, uh, one of the things I didn't show which we looked at was what are the other ways you could access technology that doesn't necessarily involve buying it. And in some cases, for instance, we found paths that went through VC firms and uh, private equity firms, uh, others that went through uh, entities that were holding the IP to the technology but didn't um, actually develop the technology. So, so we think these views, um, you know, maybe it's a simplification to say M&A. Um, why M&A? I think it's because of the value, monetary value and the importance for strategic decisions for firms, uh, but partnerships are, are proving that uh, it could be a faster and less costly way, actually, path to a technology. So I, I definitely agree that um, it, it, I think it can be leveraged even more so. Excellent. All right, uh, we have a few more minutes, so if anybody has any more last minute questions, uh, feel free to drop them. Uh, Nisi, do you have any uh, contacts uh, people may be able to reach out to you with any questions? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So let me go back to uh, my email address. So, uh, okay, right here, Nisa Sabri at Sloan, MIT.edu, feel free. Um, I also didn't share, you know, applications uh, within our company itself, but we also use uh, this approach for um, organic growth into new um, spaces, white spaces for applications for our technology as well as an organic growth in identifying um, interesting targets. Excellent. Well, I guess that's going to uh, wrap up our Q&A session. Uh, slides okay. will be available on uh, the SPM website later this week. And I'd like to uh, thank you, Nisia, for doing a uh, wonderful presentation, as well as everyone uh, who came out and uh, watched uh, the presentation. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. All right.